So what's today's topic? I've been teaching filmmaking for a while and I've developed a top five most common problems with student films list. Most of them originate in scripting and directing, but what can an editor do to fix these things? So what's number five in the hit list of biggest mistakes that student filmmakers make? Mistaking your own experience for cinema. I'm going crazy. It's like I'm looking in the mirror. You often get students who get some idea for their film from something that really happened to them. And they say, oh no, but that's what really happened. But it's not cinema, is it? Every day. My life is not a movie. Well, I could see why they would make that mistake, because we're teaching that you should tell your personal story. She's my baby! What are you on about? I'm pregnant. Cinematic empathy is more nuanced than just sympathy with someone's situation. So the challenge is to take that and turn it into something universal. Well, it's just into something that has a kind of a, an emotional flow, a rhythmic shape. It needs to kind of condense things into experiences for an audience and not just repeats of the writer, director, or student's experience. So how do we fix this? The editor isn't necessarily the writer-director, and what the editor is doing to make a story come to life on the screen is giving it emotional dynamics and rhythmic shape. That's why it's often really good to give it to an editor who will look for what is significant about the material. But it's still better if the writer-director can figure it out before it gets to editing or shooting. What's the fourth biggest mistake student filmmakers make? Just casting and performance problems. Don't you want to go to a, a place of awe and, and wonder? Yeah, Dillman. I call that sleep. No, Steve. I mean happy land. Casting is really, really hard. What I find is that students don't spend enough time on it. Mm -hmm. It's worth working harder on. The biggest job of a director is casting. I think Milos Foreman said that oh, my job is done once I cast it. <laughs> So how can we as beginning filmmakers that don't have access to the top level talent do a better job at casting? When you're in an audition process, being nervous yourself and thinking, oh, what does this person think of me? Try something that maybe isn't exactly the performance that you're trying to get out of someone. If you like the actor in the audition, do an adjustment. And it's not about having the actor do exactly what you told them to do. Can an actor translate what I just directed. I just want to see a change. Is that believable, authentic, or does that immediately throw them and it feels off? And you try to present yourself as something you're not. Do you see how I would have a problem with that? What students often tell an actor is like, be sad. And that's just poison for an actor. <laughs> I'm sorry those people were so rude to you. That's okay. I'm used to it. An editor can do a lot to change and repair a performance, but if the actor has something to do, if that actor's body is fully invested in doing their action, then the editor has a huge amount more material to work with. This cuts down a lot on casting and performance problems. So what's number three on what students do wrong? I get a lot of dialogue written as exposition. I need to get some things sorted out. The actor saying what they're doing. You have a choice. A choice. I'm leaving. And can we either get rid of the line or turn it into an action instead of being a, a statement? A choice. A choice. Dialogue is not information. Dialogue is character. Exactly. And I know I should have been there for her, friend. I wasn't. The emotional content is what is actually the story. You know, if they say, I'm going shopping when they're not going shopping, then you're revealing, you know, that this character is a liar. They can find out when, you know, some lines are just unsayable. They're so on the nose or there's so much exposition in them. Why do you spend time inside when you could go out and live your life? They can realize that because they can feel it in their own bodies, which is like using the editor's implicit knowledge before you get into editing. 
they're mirroring it in a sense and then they're shaping it so that it feels right. You know, maybe some of this can be done at script stage. I mean, the reality really is that the rewriting is a big part of editing by reshaping, by taking out, uh, by infusing drama, conflict into an exposition scene that wasn't written into the script. It, it comes on all levels. It's good to be on. Including characters telling each other what audiences already know or can see. You're messed up. You're lying to yourself. And you're lying to my mum. Drop the dialogue and try to just work with what's visible on the screen, work with actors' actions more. That leaves number two. Repeated emotional beats is a moment where the same emotion is being expressed without complication or escalation, without subtext, and often without consequences. Whoa. Oh, why? Hey, have you got a dog? Oh, Are you hungry? I was looking at a rough cut from an aspiring filmmaker who asked me to just give feedback. She was showing me the first 22 minutes of her film. My response was, after seeing the cut, you should cut that down to two minutes and it's going to be awesome. Because you're setting up the character, you know exactly what her problem is, how she feels, and then we go. Right. To make it work, to actually tell a story that people care about, and just focus on the gold, on the good stuff, the, the milestones of that emotional journey. It's really a question of giving us some nuance to those feelings so that we can change with it. I ask my students, editors, to make script timings. They have to take the script as it stands and they have to act it out themselves and they have to time it. They're making sure that the script isn't too kind of even, like every scene is 30 seconds long. Some are much quicker and some are longer. With this timing though, you start to feel a rhythm or a flow that might occur, and then they can give those insights back to the production team just by acting it out. There needs to be a path, a journey you can't just stay stagnant. I think that is a huge, huge problem with uh, films in general. So what's even a bigger problem? I actually think this one is probably the source of almost all the ends. others. Refusing to answer the question, what is this film about? And usually the first answer is it's about the plot, whatever the plot is. But that's not what the film is really about. What is your theme? If you don't know what your theme is, then you don't know what your perspective is on it. You're going to get a lot of repeated emotional beats. And you're going to get a lot of dialogue as exposition. Casting might be really difficult because you don't know what it is you're looking for in terms of theme and perspective. And it could really be that you're mistaking your own experience for cinema. Theme is really what the audience connects to on a deeper level because you can translate that to your own experience and then you still can make that connection to the film. Right, and as a filmmaker, that's your perspective on that theme and that's what the film is. And, and as you say, that's what the audience connects to. Why would it be helpful to look at student films and judge them for things that they're doing wrong. You have to be able to say what it is you're doing. You have to be able to offer students something more than it's just intuitive. If we can articulate more about what it is that we do, we can actually advance the art of editing. Maybe sometimes we still make those mistakes and we just don't know it. All the time. <laughs> So today we're going to talk about three ways to get your edit to feel right. I'm excited about this episode because I think today we might go a little closer to that enigma that is editing. How can you tell good editing? Am I right? Absolutely right. You don't go to a movie to see continuity. What's the editor doing besides keeping continuity? How are they making the actual edits have some kind of emotional response from an audience? Rhythm in film editing is time, energy, and movement shaped by timing, pacing, and trajectory phrasing for the purpose of creating cycles of tension and release. 
some wonderful scholars and colleagues of mine in the Netherlands wrote an article called Seeing Yourself in the Past, in which they say viewers are able to infer the meanings from the cinematic form because they embody the knowledge that filmmakers use to impose those meanings artistically. So what they're saying is the meaning making is grounded in your bodily knowledge, like what you know as a living being functioning in this world. So it's almost like when you see a movie and you can't quite hear the dialogue, but you still follow what's going on. Right. When we see performances on screen, we can connect to what their movement means because we know what that movement feels like in our own bodies. But what an editor is doing is actually directing our eye to the movement that's holding the really important meaning. This is one thing that continuity editing is designed to do. For his article, Attentional Theory of Cinematic Continuity, Tim J. Smith did eye tracking experiments. And then he made heat maps to show where eyes are moving as they watch film. From these experiments, Tim found that what feels right in continuity editing is a smooth attentional shift across cuts. But I'm suggesting that while smooth cuts are fine and good to make, editors might sacrifice perfect smoothness to do something more. Tim Smith's looking at this scene and he says, there's something weird going on here. There's one cut that doesn't work in the way that I'm theorizing that it works. For whatever reason, that owl looks over Deckard's head and it cues your eyes to slip over Deckard's head and then you slip him back. I see. And we're talking milliseconds, right? Not at a conscious level. If you look at the other shots in the scene, your eyes go directly to the other character's eyes. A cut can do more than preserve continuity. And if it can, it will. If artistry of another order is available. This kind of slight mismatch in the, in the gazes of the two characters, the owl and Deckard, it's not accidental. Maybe this is intentional because something happened that disrupts the stability of the scene. Exactly. I reckon this cut disrupts this rule of smooth attention, but it feels right for three reasons. It creates a movement phrase. It's like a statement of a rhythmical idea. So you say, the owl moves right, left, Deckard moves right, left. It engages us in its rhythm at a bodily level. It adds a rhythmic quality to the narrative, to the storytelling. I would also say it does something else that's really important. It creates kinesthetic empathy. It creates empathy in the viewer's body with Deckard's own kind of uneasiness in the space. The last thing it does is it, it creates subtext. When you make that rhythmic phrase, one, two, one, two, essentially this cut is saying Deckard and the owl are alike. Mm -hmm. and the next line, Rachel says, do you, you like, like our owl? owl? Deckard asks, is the owl artificial? artificial? Of course it is. Deckard might also be artificial because they move alike in this way. So the cut creates a thought. It, it creates a movement phrase that makes us think and feel just through the rhythm of the movement. The reward is on the audience because they kind of have a hunch at that point. They suspect something. What kind of movie is this? And that hunch, it's, it's the right feeling for that moment. And it was created by the editors. It seems you feel our work is not a benefit to the public. Here's another theory why something feels right to an editor. What feels right is the movement that triggers embodied simulation response. Vittorio Galesi, the Italian neuroscientist, has articulated as being this way that our bodies will respond to movement by mirroring it. And that's how we know what it means. That's how we can empathize with movement. And that's how we know how things feel to other people. I think I'll never have a shower again. I was at South by Southwest, saw the film that I cut, and I sat deliberately with the audience. The 
great thing is I can pick up the energy of the room that way. It's not so much really observing them, it's like just picking it up. What I imagine it is with birds flying in synchrony, they just feel where they are and they make these slight adjustments. After seeing it three times with three different audiences, I could really pinpoint specific moments in the film where I'm like, we're taking too much time to explain something. Let's cut that. I had this opportunity to just open up the movie again and just make those slight adjustments for what I think is going to be a better experience. Fantastic example of putting theory into practice. You watch your film with other people in the room and you use your sense of embodied simulation to improve your cuts. It's getting there. What Galazi is trying to get at is before sharing the experiences of the characters, the viewer shares the experiences of the camera. Galazi makes an example of this fantastic scene from the film Notorious, a Hitchcock film. We think she's moving towards the keys, and then it turns out it's actually just the camera moving towards the keys, and she's still stuck back in the doorframe wondering whether to move or not. Just before that important camera move, the last few frames of that shot of Alicia are slightly out of focus. And you can tell by the fact that it's out of focus that neither Hitchcock nor the camera operator really expected her to do that. And what the editor, whose name is Theron Worth, has done mm -hmm. is he's prioritized movement phrasing over perfect focus. He's making us feel with Alicia, and that camera movement is more important than keeping the shot. The other thing that I notice is that she moves forward and stops, mm -hmm. and then the camera that is in a stop position starts moving. Yep. So it's really not one continuous movement, it's really two waves. It's a movement phrase, it has a rhythm, and you can kind of imagine it as a breath rhythm or something. It's like if she going, <gasps> and then the camera's going, <gasps> you know, and, and there's that little stutter between them that is how our body feels in response to her like terribly anxious state. That's a trajectory phrase that makes us feel with the character. The editor is an expressive artist in shaping this movement, and they're using their own body to make something feel right. That's the cool thing about this is these are the thousand little decisions that you do as an editor on your own time when you start telling that story. This brings me to my third example, which this amazing editor, Sven Pape, who has what I'm calling kinesthetic imagination. Oh, uh, let's do it. What is that? Kinesthetic imagination is this capacity to kind of imagine movement feeling. It's strengthened like a muscle through lots of practice and through respecting that question, does it feel right, and getting in there and making it feel right. Your episode, which is the upside of procrastination, this crazy good editor, Sven Pape, shows us like 17 possible shots he could use to make this sequence. If he used all those 17 shots, he could make something that has perfect continuity. It's basically Mark waking up and he's sneaking out. So his brother is still sleeping. He's also checking on his mom. Then he writes a note, takes a push pin, comes down the stairs, puts the note on the wall. The note says, I love you, keep going. And then he disappears. Then you go away and you're letting them play around in your imagination as possible combinations. And you're kind of imagining movement flows. And when you come back to it the next day, you just have three shots. It's poetry. So we've seen these three examples. What's the take home from this? An editor may use time, space, and movement in any number of creative ways to generate physically, emotionally, and narratively expressive sequences. So I want to ask you, the audience, what you think is the most important part of editing that makes it feel right. Now, there's a really cool deep dive on the eye tracking experiments by Tim J. Smith. Now, here's a glimpse of Tim's presentation, plus links to both of their talks. Happy editing. So this is a, a demonstration from There Will Be Blood that I did a few years ago. 
where we can look at the gaze behavior and how it switches with the social interaction of the characters in the sequence. So when Paul looks down and touches the map, your gaze will go down and follow his interest. If the dialogue switches between Daniel and Paul, your gaze goes with it too, switches to Paul, and then switches to uh, Daniel's son, HW, over here. We also cue gaze by one person looking at another character or by suddenly moving their hands. Sudden social changes like that will draw attention to it, and it does it pretty universally across viewers. This can be used in the edit because you can anticipate when and where gaze is going to go. So you can create a shift in attention that you can then use to guide attention to a new shot. Hi, this is This Guy Edits, and I'm with Dr. Karen Perlman. I'm thrilled to present a new series for you that we like to call The Science of Editing. Karen, you are actually a doctor of editing. Is that a fair statement? I can't really help you if you don't feel well. I can help if your film doesn't feel right. Nice. Is there any scientific merit to the art of editing? What I'm really interested in, in an underlying way, is how do editors think? So I'm reading a lot about cognitive science and philosophy and psychology, and I'm really fortunate to have some colleagues who are working in these areas who are happy to consult with me to see what we can understand about what really is an editor's expertise. Can we say more than it just works? Or it's just instinct. Right. If we say it's just instinct, that's not really that helpful to someone who wants to learn how to edit. So I'm looking to find what is the workings of the mind of an editor? One of the things that stuck out to me is that you say great editing is actually not invisible. Yeah. Based on my PhD thesis, I was able to write some guidelines for the Australian Screen Editors Guild so that they could judge their editing awards. Editors shape three kinds of movement. They shape the movement of story, they shape movement of emotion, and they shape movement of image and sound. So when you're seeing a film that moves well, you're seeing good editing. Sometimes I think I'd prefer Arrival of Flesh and Blood. Oh, Emily, I don't spend that much time on the newspaper. It isn't just the time. Let's get into our first topic. You wrote a book called Cutting Rhythms, and you have a chapter in there about on-screen drafting and how it can be helpful for filmmakers. What is on-screen drafting? You've heard editors say that the editor writes the last draft of the script. Quentin Tarantino saying the editor writes the last draft of the script. Martin Scorsese has said it. George Lucas has said it. And it occurred to me, why not bring the editor in sooner while you're still writing the script? and make the script better by using the editor's thinking to develop the script. I like this one. But you don't need it. Editor's thinking, is it different than a director or a cameraman or an actor? An editor learns to think about movement and flow. So an editor's really special skills involve responding to the material that is on screen and shaping its movement. This is not what anyone else on the crew does. They generate the movement, they decorate it, they dress it, but what the editor does is respond to the movement. And that's a unique way of thinking. So are you saying that an editor's brain has evolved? My proposal is that the editor has specially developed their sensitivity to movement. All humans have what we call mirror neurons. And these neurons have been hypothesized to be your empathy neurons. They're how you understand what other people mean by looking at the way that they move. So when an editor sees movement on screen, she's responding to the movement using her mirror neurons. She's literally feeling the movement that she sees. This is what editors mean when they say it feels right or it doesn't feel right. Because as they shape the movement, they shape it and reshape it so that their neurons light up in exactly the right way for that moment in the edit. Now, you can't do that on paper. You can only do that with moving images. And that's why I'm proposing we need to make an on-screen draft. Take me through this. How do you make an on-screen draft? I think we can agree that filmmaking is an art form. And the processes for making films were actually defined long before we had digital tools. Traditionally, when you're making a film, you first shoot it, and well, you first write it, and then you shoot it, and then you cut it. And what I'm suggesting with an on-screen draft is that you first write it, 
and then you shoot it on really inexpensive technology and cutting it together. You use that to show you what the problems of the written script are. Then you go back and you rewrite the script again. So we're not cutting out the writer here. Have you used this process and if so, how? So in my latest short film, Woman with an Editing Bench, I actually got funding from Macquarie University to test this hypothesis about on-screen drafting. We did a two-day shoot of the first draft of the script. You know, I was pretty sure that this first draft of the script could not possibly be improved. We shot it, and I cut it together, and I learned so much about what the problems of the script were. I rewrote the script three more times. Can you give me an example where you changed because of what you've learned? One of the things I learned about my script was that my central character was getting sidelined. I could see through the mise-en-scene in the draft that she was being pushed to the side while the other two characters had the main argument that was at the center of the drama. When I went to do the real thing, I rewrote it so that she stayed central to the action and all eyes were on her. I may have some inventory to do before I start editing your project, Boris. Some of the problems that I come across when I'm editing is the character's point of view is somewhat fuzzy or there's not a focus on it. It can be really hard to tell from a script that's written on paper whether your central character's perspective will be the one that dominates the film. An editor has a lot of tricks for making that central character's point of view be the one that the audience follows. It's all about having the central character look and then cutting to what they see. If you're not here at seven o'clock, you ain't gonna keep the job. Okay, and there's some other things you learned by using on-screen drafting. In the original, I had set up this backstory that the main character would be old friends of the guards. And so when the guards come to shut down her edit suite, it made the stakes just plummet into nothing. I then rewrote it so that the guards are actually menacing. She actually is frightened. And I learned that from the on-screen draft. If you had to give somebody a list of how to do on-screen drafting, what are the steps? Number one, write the first draft of the script. Number two, get out your iPhone and shoot that first draft. Number three, bring in the editor and cut it together. Number four, let the editor rewrite the script to make it work on screen. Number five, try it out on people, see what they think. Be warned though, it's gotta be ugly. And the reason it has to be ugly is that nobody can get too attached to it. You can let go of everything because it's just a draft. There's a, an article by Andy Clark that talks about sketching being what he calls, quote, a surrogate situation. It allows you to have some non-habitual uses of imagination. If you're not under the same time or money pressure, you might just try something else, and that might create a new way of doing something. Is it practical to shoot the entire movie? Oh, when I get my students to do it, I make them do the whole film because they're only making five-minute films. Uh, yeah. Obviously, when you're doing a feature, you don't want to spend those weeks and weeks doing it. But I have heard of people making features and shooting the whole thing, shoot it in three days, cut it in six days. You learn immediately. It's a complete aha moment. On-screen drafting is fantastic. It taught me a huge amount about the script, about the characters, about the mise-en-scene. But in the end, the editor still wrote the last draft of the script. I dropped yeah. scenes, I changed dialogue. Everything you say about editing in your videos, I did it. If you want to learn more about the... Oops, now this is uh, something that I could put in there, a placeholder where I'm supposed to shamelessly plug a free mini course secret editing hacks. And I'm proud to do it because it's a system that I developed over many years on how to set myself up every time to be really creative and come up with the best possible edit. It's not something that really relies on my talent, it's a system where I very much make sure that I find the best moments. I'm sharing it with you. You can have it for free if you go to secreteditinghacks.com, leave your email there, and then you'll get instant access. Thanks so much. Cheers. When you ask an editor what they literally do in the edit suite, generally an editor will say, well, it's intuitive. And, and that's fair enough. But I think it's possible to say more than that. What actions of mind an editor actually goes through in getting from a mass of material to something coherent.
So you actually broke it down into five different steps. The first thing an editor literally does is watch the material. What does that mean? Good question. Why is that some kind of expert ability? An editor doesn't watch the same way an audience watches or even the same way a director watches. An editor is a trained watcher who actually does three things. They watch and have immediate responses, just like an audience, right? They laugh, they cry, they get annoyed, whatever. But the second thing they're also doing is that they're noticing their responses. An audience might just feel something, but an editor feels something and then notices that they feel something. And then the third thing that an editor is doing is kind of the very early stages of imagining how this is all gonna go together. Now, does that affect the way they feel? So in an ordinary person, you know, if you're watching and noticing what you feel at the same time, that can make you a bit like paralyzed. But an editor can feel something and make a mental note and keep feeling. I think that's an expert capacity that actually gets trained or developed. This is a quote from Kate Amend. I do sit and watch the footage and check my first reaction to what I see. If I laugh, I make a note of it. If I cry, and I do cry watching dailies, then I know that if it resonates with me, it's going to resonate with an audience. That's what I do to begin. And then I start to build the story or scene and make those connections. That's really interesting because when I first watch something and I have a strong emotional reaction, I make a check mark. I make sure that I don't forget that first initial reaction to something. So sometimes you get lost in the edit. You don't know what's working, what's not working anymore. Exactly. Then I just recall that I had this initial emotional response and I can just trust that I should go with that. And, and Walter Murch talks about that too. It's a very kind of physical, almost impulsive, like check, 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 check. Cool. What does an editor do as a second step? The next thing the editor does is something I'm calling sorting. You might call it logging as well. Sorting is giving the material a name or placing it in a bin with other potentially related material. And what's important about sorting? Look, I'm going to give you a quote from Alan Berliner. What you call something is crucial to the process of determining what you might end up doing with it. What he's saying there is that you're tagging the material, but you're also, in a way, tagging your memory. The big theory here is that editing is an instance of what Clark and Chalmers call extended mind. Um, thinking doesn't just happen in your brain. It doesn't just happen in your brain and your body. It happens in the brain, the body, and the material. The material itself is part of your thoughts. Uh -huh. The material is part of thinking, right? So the way that you sort it is giving it an opportunity to be different kinds of thoughts for different contexts as they arise. Right. The sorting is, quote, an epistemic action. What does epistemic mean? Epistemic comes from the Greek word episteme, meaning knowledge. I see. When you sort something, you are actually creating your knowledge of that material to alter the world so as to aid and augment cognitive processes such as recognition and search. Now that was written in a book called Supersizing the Mind by Andy Clark. And he's not talking about editing, but when you read it, you go, yeah, that's what an editor does. And I think that brings us perfectly into the next thing. What is the third thing editors literally do? Remembering. What an editor does is scroll through their digital folders, they click on shots, they glance at them to trigger memories and their feelings about those memories. So an editor uses non-biological resources to be part of their thinking and remembering. What is a non-biological resource? Your mind is biological, right? Your brain and body. And your mind is also non-biological. That is, your mind is the film. It's an extended mind. Your thoughts... It's an expression of your mind? No, it is your mind. Okay. <laughs> now, it is my mind. Here's the thing. Run with me for a minute. What Andy Clark is saying, if you took away the thing that's outside of your brain and your body, you would not be able to think. It's essentially like removing part of your brain. So think about it this way. For an editor, if you took away all the filmed material and asked the editor to edit the film, well, you can't. 
right? You, right. You, you can't edit the film unless you have the filmed material. So then the theory is that the thought doesn't just belong to you. The thought also, in a sense, belongs to the film. Walter Murch has this fantastic quote, films are much smarter than the people who make them. Editors know this, is you're respecting the material and what it has to say. But what's cool about this is that you actually have cognitive psychologists and cognitive philosophers saying, you know what, that is actually happening. The film is thinking. Mm-hmm. What do you reckon? Yeah, you sound, you sound like a maybe, I'm, maybe no, not I'm, on that one. <laughs> I mean, whenever I cut a film, I usually, before I cut it, I have some form of creative agreement with whoever, the director, the producer. We both think this is what the scene is. And then the moment I start cutting it, it immediately goes in a different direction. Right. And most of the time I will not fight that. I will just go along with it and then just present it to the director and many times be very surprised that they actually embrace it as opposed to trying to, well, that's not what we talked about. So yeah, I think I could agree with that. Yeah, an editor who doesn't let the material do some of the thinking isn't a very good editor. Cool. Shall we move on to number four? So you've been watching, you've been sorting, you've been remembering. What happens next is selecting. You can't compose a film without first making selections. But every selection you make changes the film that you are making. If you select one thing that's really good and then you select another thing that's really good and you put them together and they don't really work together, then you go back and you select something different. What's the last thing an editor literally does? Composing. Now, most people might just call this editing. It's like, oh, yeah, it's when you put all the shots together. But Mm -hmm. we're calling it composing because we want to distinguish that all five of those things we've talked about are editing. And composing is just that moment where you actually put the selects into a timeline and shape them in relation to each other. You might also have to go back and watch or sort or remember or select again because the material might ask for something different than you thought it would. I really spend my time looking at shots, sorting them, and thinking which are the moments that are great on its own. That's really interesting. The reason why I really try to keep selecting and composing two separate things is I don't want to commit too early to the scene until I know everything about the material independent of the scene. That makes sense. Can you pause that? <clears throat> yes, give me a second. I reckon, Sven, this is one of the things that makes you a great editor, if I may say so. You may. <laughs> Thank you. I reckon that you have patience. It's something great editors have. I watch people trying to edit and I see them get excited by something and they start shaping it and then you kind of dig yourself into a hole by composing it in one direction when it could go a much more interesting direction if you'd just been a little bit more patient. Here's another really nice analogy and this is from David Kirsch. It's like a Scrabble board. What you do is you rearrange those letters in your tray looking for words. And you rearrange those letters and you look at the board and you say, oh, there's, there's a D out there. Look, I have an O and a G. I can make dog. Oh, but look, I can rearrange it and make it say God as well. This is an analogy where David Kirsch is saying, you can't think without the letters, without moving the letters around. And this is what an editor is doing as well. As Jonathan Oppenheim says, I make connections that I didn't expect and everything evolves. Perfect. So those are five things that I think an editor literally does. They watch, they sort, they remember, they select, and they compose. And all five of those things might be happening all at once, which makes the editor a real expert. But I don't know, there might be other things happening too. What do you think? Steven Soderbergh's latest film was edited by Mary Ann Bernard. Mary Ann Bernard cut over 15 of his films and 30 of his TV episodes. As I get older, I find it more difficult to have to kind of sit down and articulate why I made certain decisions. It runs counter to how I make those 
adaptive decisions, which is to be more instinctual and not to analyze. But Marianne Bernard is not real. So I got in touch with you, Sven, because I want to talk about directors who edit their own films. Marianne Bernard is actually Steven Soderbergh. In early film, you know, nobody had any specific role. The, the whole thing of credits and defined roles and unions, all that comes much later. Mm -hmm. So at first, the director's making all the decisions and then just telling the editors, you know, cut here, cut there. But it keeps getting more complicated. And so the editors start to be in the sort of viewing room as we are now, and we're like making decisions with the director. Part of storytelling sort of evolves away from directors and to editors, and editors become storytellers. So you go from this shot. You can't go back to the ship. To that. This is a high powered editing team right here. They're a very quiet bunch, they're editors, but they're here to save my ass today, okay? Later in film history, around, you know, the 1960s and 70s especially, we get this idea that the director is the author, the film's author, right? The auteur theory. Right. It raises a lot of questions for me. Why does one person get that name of author? Especially because, you know, as you know, the editor writes the last draft of the script right? Mm -hmm. So there's the script writer, there's the production, and then there's the editing, and, and these kind of three versions of the script all exist, and, and the film is actually made in the edit suite. Right. So these are the kind of things I'm thinking about, and I guess I'm kind of coming around to the question, should editors be considered authors? And one of the ways I'm looking at this is now by looking at directors who edit. I'm thinking, okay, what's going on there? Why are they editing their own films? And is that a good idea? There's obviously this secret contract between editors and directors. When they go into an editing bay, they kind of make this deal that they are exploring the film. There's what is called the editor's cut, which is like the first shot, the first crack at a film. Mm -hmm. You kind of play around with the film, the film gets done, and then the director walks out of the editing bay with a finished film, ideally. Right. and presents it to the world and gets all the credit. Yes. <laughs> the editors are kind of okay with it because that's kind of how it's been and that's that's kind of the understanding. Now, granted, this guy edits the YouTube channel. It started with the idea to celebrate editing and turn editors into stars themselves in a way. And this is us. It's not glamorous. Nice. I can <laughs> feel the history. Yeah. To celebrate their creative participation in the process. So obviously I'm a big fan of giving the editors more credit than they currently get on films. Nick, do you think I can show any of it? Yeah, we, we might be able to pull it up. Sometimes people, you know, say, the, oh, well, the director is the author because they're the ones who are making all the decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously that's, that's not true in editing because what happens in editing is the editor makes literally thousands of decisions. And then they kind of hand that to the director and the director says yes or no. They'll put something in, it's a collaboration. It's not like the editor's making the decisions all by themselves. I'm just gonna make this a little longer. But the editor has made thousands of decisions and is responsible for thousands of decisions that the director more or less just ratifies in that sense. Yep. And so one of the reasons I'm really curious about directors who edit is I'm wondering about this idea that in a way they're still directing while they're editing. They're the exceptions that prove this rule that editing is part of directing. Oh, interesting. There's a few key examples of this and the one that really pops out at the moment is Chloe Zhao. And the Oscar goes to Chloe Zhao, Nomadland. Come down. She edited Nomadland. Maybe when I die, my friends will gather around a fire and toss a rock into the fire in memory of me. The editing of Nomadland is incredible. It is so sensitive and beautiful and intelligent. And I was amazed when I got to the end and saw the credit and realized that the director had actually edited it. Do you have like some examples of why you think it was edited well? What I thought was really exquisitely done about Nomadland was the structure and the rhythm. So the structure, how it's organized, how events unfold, that couldn't have been scripted or not completely scripted. The scripting was still literally going on in the editing process because it was part documentary. 
they didn't know what people were going to say or do exactly. Yeah, I read that many of the characters in the film are actually real nomads playing themselves and not actors. Yes. I wish I had an easy answer for you, but I think you've come to the right place to find an answer. And when I look at No Man Land, I think, you know, you can see the director continuing to direct through the editing because you can see her still thinking, still asking the question, what is this film? How can this film be itself? Which are questions that editors ask. Being a director, you know, we get a lot of credits as directors, but it's teamwork. It's never about one person's vision, really. You know, I don't, I don't I'm not really a huge fan of that word, to be honest. <laughs> Now, you, you mentioned that, that secret contract that directors and editors have to explore things together. And I, I sometimes think that editors are kind of like mind readers. Mm -hmm. I have this article I've written called Editing in the Vulcan Mind Meld, right? Where you kind of, as an editor, you need to sort of absorb the thinking and the rhythms of the material that's in front of you and of the director and of your intended audience. You know, you kind of a conduit for all kinds of different thinking that's coming together in you as the editor and then expressing itself in the edits, which are your thoughts, your visible thoughts. But I think that when you have a director who's editing, I guess I'm wondering, is that for them a more efficient way of thinking? Like instead of trying to put their thoughts through an editor's body, they're just going direct to the material and thinking with the material the way that editors do? I think it can be. It's definitely more efficient because you're immediately going from what your vision is to executing on that. You don't have to communicate it. The downfall really is when you are also editing as a director is you're missing the second set of eyes. You're going to have to cut this. Right. That is so important in the editing. I always wanted to direct. Everybody so, wants to direct. That's so, a bumper sticker and a t-shirt. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Action Lenny. Yeah, I've been in that situation where I've cut a film on my own that I directed. And I'm kind of just, I can only push it as far as what I'm capable of. It doesn't matter whether I'm directing or whether I'm editing. Like, I can only push it this far. Let's say I'm the editor and I'm in the editing bay and then the director comes in then the director takes the ball and keeps playing with it while well, I'm done playing at this point for a certain amount. I need some pushback. I need somebody to say, this doesn't work. Let's try something different. Now, also, directors and editors actually have really different skills. And maybe directors lose out on a little something when they don't employ these specialist skills that editors have. Directors need to interpret the script, the words on the page. Editors need to interpret the movement that they have imprinted on the camera card or the film strip. Directors also have to elicit performances. This is a big part of their skill, dealing with the interpersonal aspects, getting the best out of people. What editors have to do is then shape those performances, put them into a dynamic relationship, but have them make sense together and make sense over the whole. So again, the director is instigating or generating possibilities editors have to decide. They have to make that final, really controlled decision, which shot where and for how long. It's really important for young directors to work with editors especially because young directors tend to not really realize either what's wrong with the material that they've created or what its deep potential is and they need those outside eyes to find that for them. Same here. Let's take this one. I have to say from my own experience, the first time that I directed, this is more on me. I basically pushed the editor out. Get out. I mean it. I have to admit that. It was very friendly. <laughs> he was a great sport and he didn't mind at all. So I'm very grateful for the experience. I've had the same experience. Ben. I think because my training is first in editing, it's just so hard for me to let go and give it to an editor. My thought needs to go through my hands. I can't verbalize my thought. It's, I can just do it. The thinking happens with the material. For me, there is no way to find the best solution of a scene without playing with the shots. That's how editors think. And I think directors usually don't think that way because they don't even have that available to them unless they're editing themselves. Yes. Let's talk for a minute about the different kinds of expertise because this is something I find really interesting. Yeah. 
I think the authorship analogy is a bad one. I don't think anything about filmmaking is like writing a novel. <laughs> so I think we should just ditch author, right? That's the wrong analogy for directing. I think though that directing and editing are actually really different skills and different forms of expertise. Here's my experience. When I am directing, if I were going to make an analogy, it's more like conducting an orchestra than it is like um, authoring a novel. As a director, you just don't have that much control. You're throwing a whole bunch of pieces into the mix. You know, you're saying to the actor who's like the first violinist, you know, play this music and they play it how they play it, you know, and then you've got the designer and you're saying it's a you know, it's a futuristic dystopian and they design it how they design it. And you go in just like with the editing process and you say, oh, a little more this, a little less that, so on and so forth. But in my experience, directing is not really about control. It's about instigating. Mm -hmm. Whereas editing is really ultimately about control. Like every single frame that's in the final cut has been put there deliberately. It's all in there on purpose. And I feel like these are two different kinds of expertise almost. This expertise of making something happen and this expertise of pulling it into shape, into form. I remember an interview by Quentin Tarantino where he described directing. As a director, your job is to hire talented people. Your job is explaining your vision. Your job is articulating to them what you want on the screen. And then all of a sudden, the whole mystical, shamanistic thing that I thought directing was just went boop. And I realized I could do that. That it wasn't this Merlin-like magic kit that I needed to know the, the right spell in order to conjure. I, you oh, I can describe what I want. I know what's in my head. <laughs> That's the easiest yeah. part. I'm good at describing. Hey. Action. And it's really important. One reason it's so important is that, you know, actors and designers and DOPs, they can do anything. I mean, they're amazing, they're miraculous. So they need a direction to go in. But the difference is directors don't give instruction, they give direction, yep. right? But they don't put their hands on anything. So when we talk about the thoughts going through our hands, and you know this kind of really direct uh, translation of some impulse or idea that isn't even fully formed into some material form that it can be worked with, that some um, directors are working through other people to make that happen. Hello, hot stuff. How are those pickles? Real good. So what should be change or what, what should change? I would say that the idea that individuals make films is pretty flawed. Mm -hmm. One thing I would like to see changing, which I don't know how many of your listeners will care about, but here's one of my proposals. When academics are citing, when we're writing, there's this little Latin phrase that we're supposed to use when there's more than one author. And that Latin phrase is et al. It's short for et alia. So here's a proposal. What if when we're writing about film, we don't say a Scorsese film, we say a f film by Scorsese et al. And it just puts it out there that there's more than one author. I just worked with a German director doing a feature film, and when I saw the credits for the first time, it said a film by, and he had the entire crew on one slate. I saw Guardians of the Galaxy number two. Right. Like just the opening, it never cuts, stays on little Groot. The battle's in the background. He's just interested in dancing and the music that's going on, which is like from the 70s or something, because that's real and authentic. It was so just trying to be clever. Get out of the way, you're gonna get hurt! Hi! Every detail was taken care of but I didn't care for any of it. I need imperfection in movies. Ah, that's an interesting idea. You need to feel like there's actually something ragged edge that could be unknown. Exactly, unknown. But that's gonna be a super big problem because you know when you go into the movie, there's already like a, a very heavy narrative control, perfection as you call it, that isn't gonna be disrupted. <laughs> I 
guess when we're talking about why big blockbuster action movies can be really boring, we need to understand what is a narrative. In their book Film Art, Ordwell and Thompson write about the idea that what a narrative is, is a series of events in a cause and effect chain. What will this action cause? And we make hypothesis. We think, oh, that action, he might die or he might triumph. But we need to have those questions to keep us interested in the narrative. We have to worry. We already know that the hero is not going to get hurt. We don't worry about the narrative chain. And the other problem is genre expectations in the action blockbuster. We expect the heroes to feel invincible. When can they be vulnerable if our feeling state is always toughness? They can't be touched, so they don't touch us. That's it. I want to kill some guys. Ah! He's my brother. He killed 80 people in two days. He's adopted. I've killed things from other worlds before. She with you? I thought she was with you. What the writers are doing is they're substituting vulnerability for humor, trying to let us feel connected to them by feeling like, huh, they're so witty. I was just trying to get you there. Phil Jackson, we good, right? But witty is similar to tough. We don't feel it in our bodies as a kind of vulnerability. Yeah. The third problem for the big action blockbuster, and this might be why you found Guardians of the Galaxy 2 kind of boring, is the problem of spectacle. Ooh, what's a spectacle? In his book, William Brown sums up some of the many film theory debates about narrative versus spectacle by saying spectacle has come, quote, broadly speaking, to be equated with those moments in film that puncture narrative flow through moments of exhibition or display. So anything that is like a huge fight, that's a spectacle? Yeah, or an even simpler way to think about musicals. There's a narrative going on, you know. Boy mm -hmm. meets girl, boy loses girl, and the narrative chain keeps moving in cause and effect. But then when you get to a musical number, it kind of pauses. We just watch, like, singing and dancing. The story stops. Yeah, movies, when they're spectacular, the narrative doesn't move forward. We pause the narrative and we just watch things that move in exciting ways. So you can either have a movie where the narrative stops and we watch a spectacle, or a movie where we don't have anything that's so spectacular, we just have the narrative keep going. And I'm saying there's a middle way, which is what I'm calling the narrative slow-mo. That sounds interesting. <laughs> Maybe. In, in the narrative slow-mo, it's like the narrative keeps going, but the causal chain isn't advancing as quickly. Instead, it's interleaved with something that we might almost call poetic. What you're saying is, if we have a character enter into a spectacle, then yep. the narrative still moves forward as we're trying to figure out how he achieves that goal. Exactly. So like if you go back to Fred Astaire movies. His goal was usually to win Ginger Rogers, right? Mm -hmm. In their first dance number together, they usually start as antagonists, like they're in some kind of fight. The music starts and he pulls her into a dance and by the end they're in love. So we've managed to see the narrative problem continue and change. I'm gonna say Matrix 1, that's the perfect balance between narrative and spectacle. I think it is. It engages my mind and my body. You have a character who's immediately vulnerable. In order for Neo to become a hero, it isn't just that he has to get strong and beat people up. He has to philosophically understand the difference between being an individual and being part of the oneness of being. It's not just spectacle and it's not just narrative. It's also philosophically engaging. A lot of realization of, of Buddhist philosophy, of, of coming into enlightenment, in a sense. And he's moving towards enlightenment through the action. So in that action scene, we align with him as a character. And the closer he gets to enlightenment, the more physically he's able to make his world function. Do you think that goes for the whole series? I think Matrix 1 is the perfect balance between narrative, 
philosophy and spectacle. And I think Matrix 2 and 3, they're mostly interesting to me for how they fail to make that balance work. You must be ready to die. So be it. The philosophy gets kind of separated from the action. People talk about some interesting and rich philosophical idea, and then they fight. Right. Agent Smith now is replicated. Yep. It doesn't matter whether he fights one of those guys. It doesn't matter whether he fights ten of those. Every battle is basically a tie. They fight for ten minutes and then they walk away. Not only does the narrative stop, but the ideas stop and it's just fighting. And I think this is a really big problem in lots of movies. In order for us to synchronize our bodies with something rhythmically, it has to have dynamics like prepare, action, recover. And if it's just hit, 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 they're pressing on the same button. There's no like body to body empathy. How do you define body to body empathy? I know it must hurt when you smash your hand in a car door because I have a hand and I have got it caught somewhere before even if not in a car door. So my body empathizes with your body because I have had similar sensations myself. I recommend looking at the work by phenomenologist Edith Stein. She has a fantastic idea of shared experience that could certainly apply to movies. So she writes in German, I'm gonna give you one of her ideas as explained by Marianne Sawicki. In entertainments of various kinds, we live vicariously through the experiences of others. The somatic registration of vertigo from observing the flying acrobat. The somatic registration of sexual arousal from reading erotic literature. So phenomenology is a branch of philosophy that studies our experience. And it actually meets cognitive science in the work of Vittorio Galesi. His work on mirror neurons is showing us ways that neurologically we understand each other's experiences. Here's what he writes. There are neural mechanisms mediating between the multi-level personal experience we entertain of our lived body and the implicit certainties we simultaneously hold about others. Such personal and body-related experiential knowledge enables us to understand the actions performed by others and to directly decode the emotions and sensations they experience. So based on our past experience of pleasure or pain, and because our brain fires the same nerve signals, we can feel with the hero as if it's happening to us. That's it. And so the problem then with the superhero movie is when they make the action scenes, if they make them not have actual striving or pain in the sequence, then our bodies don't have anything to connect to. The body-to-body -body empathy is huge. Mm -hmm. If yeah. I think about a master, I think Jim Jarmusch makes us empathize with characters. A love poem? Yeah, I guess if it's for you, it's a love poem. I go through trillions of molecules that move aside to make way for me, while on both sides, trillions more stay where they are. The movie Patterson is extraordinary. You drop your body into that, like the first image, and it just holds you there the whole time. And really, like, there's not a lot of narrative tension there. When they teach Aristotle as the basis for Hollywood narrative theory, what they're saying is that the events need to be surprising but logical. Now, right. Jim Jarmusch is not a subscriber to the Hollywood theory <laughs> at all, but it occurs within a world that we have willingly submerged ourselves into. So Jim Jarmusch should be doing the next Guardians of the Galaxy. I would so sign up for that. What's the big takeaway? Everything yep. we've discussed so far, what can we glean from this in terms of how we should be cutting? Well, we talked about spectacle and getting the balance right between narrative events and spectacular moments. We talked about dynamics and how spectacular moments can still have a prepare action and recover in them so that our bodies can feel with them. And we talked about body-to-body -body empathy, which is that really important aspect of giving us the space to feel with the bodies that we are watching so that we can feel about them and for them. 
I talk a lot about this in my book Cutting Rhythms, which is essentially arguing that an editor shapes rhythm in order to create cycles of tension and release. Whether we're shaping the rhythm of narrative events or shaping a spectacle scene where the narrative slows down, we need to shape a rhythm that the audience's body can empathize with. Two Australian editors who are really masters of this are Margaret Sixel, who cut Fury Road, and Jill Bilcock, who cut Romeo and Juliet. They understand that action sequences need to keep us aligned with the character's goals and feelings, and not just bludgeon us to death with repeated hits. We have to feel that the characters are really experiencing pain or exhilaration in order to have those sensations ourselves. For the viewers, of course, you might disagree with us passionately. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know. Hopefully, we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks so much, Karen. Thanks, Sven. I thought it might be useful to talk about some editor's tools for shaping rhythm, especially one I call trajectory phrasing. Just a heads up on this, this is not really stuff you want to be talking about with directors. It's kind of like secret editor's business. And this would be really useful because it's one that AI can't imitate. What is trajectory phrasing? A lot of my work is trying to figure out what editors are really doing. You know, I, t I teach editing and I've written a whole book about editing and I 100% will tell you that editing is intuitive, but then I have a problem, which is how do you teach something if it's intuitive? So what I've done is I've broken editing down in a way that can describe what is your intuition made of? You know, what are you really drawing on? What knowledge do you really have? Wax on, wax off. Breathe in, breathe out. You maybe kind of don't have it at a conscious level, but you have it and you're using it. And if we refine that and make it more specific and exact, can we use it better? That's my theory. I would be getting notes in the edit suite and they'd be kind of blurry to me. Like people would use words like timing and pacing. They might not be sure exactly what they mean, or that might mean everything, or they might not mean either of those things. So I wanted to understand more specifically, what is timing, what is pacing, and then I realized, okay, actually there's something missing here that editors are doing all the time, and it's just not described, and that is what I call trajectory phrasing. So I probably am just as confused as most people. What's the difference between timing and pacing? Great question, thank you. So timing, it's three things. It's, it's which frame, how long, kind of roughly, and where the shot is. Which frame is pretty clear, right? You know, you can really change a shot. You can take five frames off and you can change the whole meaning. How long a shot is in there for, you know, you can have that sunset in for 10 frames, 10 seconds. In order to illustrate this idea of timing of where you place a shot, I'm gonna get you to help me tell a joke. You have to ask me two questions. The first question is if I'm Karen Perlman, the famous comedian. And the second question is, what's the secret of my success? Now let's do this! Hey, are you Karen, the famous comedian? Why, well, yes, I am. Thank you for recognizing me. I always wanted to ask, what's the secret of your Timing. success? <laughs> if I put the chop that's like, where I say timing after your question, it wouldn't be very funny, right? But you put it in the middle there. And so that's what you're doing. You're putting a shot in relation to another shot and that's what timing is. When, what, and for how long? That's the definition of editing, is what I thought. That's all there really is. But when you talk about how it affects an audience, then some other things start to come in. The three things in pacing are the rate of cutting, how quickly or slowly you cut, the rate of change or movement inside a shot. So you might have the burglar grab the jewelry, breaks the window, kicks over the house owner, and runs. Like you could put all of that in one shot. And then you wouldn't be cutting very fast, but there'd be a lot going on in that shot. <laughs> Or the third thing in pacing is the rate of change, like overall. Is this where we run? Not yet. Like how quickly do events occur? So that's part of pacing as well. So now that we've established all that as a foundation, what's trajectory phrasing? 
the place that people usually go, huh? Is on the word trajectory, which is not used that commonly. Trajectory describes a combination of the direction of movement and the energy that propels it. But energy is the part I'm going to focus on here because what I mean by energy is like the attitude or intention not so controlled behind a movement. Come on, attack it! Attack it! Come on! If you think of like a, a soccer ball, right? And you think someone kicks the ball and scores a goal. The same soccer ball, somebody's just like having a little, you know, play in the backyard around the barbecue or whatever with some friends and they kick it between each other. It's not to score a goal, but that ball will move in a different direction, different energy. And already, even though it's just a ball and it's just inert, you can see that the different like intention or attitude makes a different energy of it in that soccer ball. When I hear the word trajectory phrasing, I'm also thinking patterns. Sort of establish a certain anticipation of what's gonna happen next, and then you break those patterns and all that stuff. Yeah, totally. I mean, essentially rhythm is movement in a pattern and trajectory is movement under force. So you're making a pattern out of different trajectories to build anticipation for something happening. Like a game is a perfect example. Kind of like Ted Lasso. When they do the soccer scenes, and I don't know if the American audience understands this, but for Europeans, it's very comical to see these scenes, the way that they're edited and the way they play soccer, because it almost feels like they're playing in slow motion. Zorro muffs it. The hammers pounce back into the mixer. And it's 3-2. Oh, it might get worse. This is from far. This is quite astonishing. It's all over now. Is it comical on purpose? No. So then what they're trying to do is explain to American audience how the game works. I think it has to do with the special effects that they use because most of the games, there's a lot of CGI, like the, how the ball flies and how they accept the ball and the audience and everything else. Sounds to me like what they've done is they've hired actors, not soccer players. And I mean, the plays are right. Whoever choreographed the plays, they make sense. It's one of those shows you wish you could get your hands on. Yes. <laughs> so, could I just help you out with this a little bit here? So how do I use this for Ted Lasso? You're going to need to know three things about your trajectory phrasing. The first one is, are your shots going to be linking or colliding? And, and the simplest way to think about it is in terms of the movement direction. If you want shots to link or, or match in a way, you keep the movement direction going left to right from one shot and then left to right in the next shot. And if you want them to collide, you go left to right in one shot and then right to left in the other shot and they go boom at each other. Is linking similar to continuity? Yes. Linking is what they do a lot in continuity. Then we have the next part of trajectory phrasing. Just so you can make shots link, but what you're also doing in continuity is you're choosing how the movement flows in different takes. If you choose the energy where he like storms into the locker room and hurls his shirt, you have a different story than if he kind of like strolls into the locker room and tosses his shirt onto the bench. You're choosing the different energy of the take and that's a really important part of the phrase. And then you have a third thing, which is stress or emphasis. You can kind of think of it as like punctuation in a way. It's very often a question of choosing a shot size. If we're doing that shirt onto the bench, do we just keep it in the wide and he kind of tosses his shirt on the bench? Is he hurling that shirt onto the bench and we like get right and close and see it slap against the wood, you know? But here's my big pitch about how you're going to use trajectory phrasing. And this one I think is highly relevant at this exact moment, which is this. AI cannot do it. Why not? Okay, before Karen is going to reveal why mastering this skill is going to protect you against the coming disruption in the entire film industry, I want to talk to you about Edit Rave 2023. Secure your free seat to our annual multi-week online editing summit that starts November 14. And you'll get access to exclusive webinars with pros that work at the highest level like Emmy-winning editor Kelly Dixon, ACE, who cut Breaking Bad, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Black Panther. 
or Roger Nygaard, ACE, editor of Curb Your Enthusiasm, Veep and White House Plumbers. We got Anthony Francisco, the lead concept artist at Marvel and the creator of Baby Groove. Plus, just like last year, we'll do another big editing challenge where you get to cut a scene and compete to win for prizes like the Creative Console from Monogram. We'll have AMAs, workshops, giveaways, deals, webinars, and a big surprise event. All accessible online for free, but seats are limited. So sign up now at editrave.com and we'll see you in November. AI cannot do it. Why not? Because AI can't tell what the effort or intention is. AI can or will soon be able to tell you most successful movies cut this quickly or slowly, mostly, you know, continuity editing. They start the scene in a wide and then they go to a mid and then they go to close. You know, there's lots of things that AI will be able to do based on learning how things have been done in the past. But what it cannot do is read intention to make a phrase that has meaning or tells story. When do you think editors will get fired and replaced by AI? We did another video a couple of years ago that was watching, sorting, remembering, selecting, and composing. And here's the interesting thing about that, is that AI can actually do four out of five of those things. But the one that it can't do is really important. AI can sort, and that's probably what it's best at. When you sort your material with AI and you get keywords put on it, then that's a way of helping the AI is doing the remembering or a lot of the remembering for you. You know, you just have to type in soccer ball and it'll show you all the shots with soccer ball. You know, in a way, do selecting and composing. You know, it can say, oh, well, these are the rules of continuity editing. I'll select a wide and then a close and then kind of analyze all the patterns that have ever been and imitate them. But what it cannot do is watch. This goes back to what we were talking about in that video where we talk about Watching for an editor isn't just looking at it, it's actually a special skill that an editor has where they can watch something and feel something about it and also notice what they're feeling. I think editors could be replaced like any minute for productions that don't care about how good they are or where they really want something to be standard and work in the patterns that have worked in the past. Sort of my intuition is that yes, there will be editors that will be replaced very soon because they are not watching, feeling and noticing, but they still work. They still create content. I just stare at my desk, but it looks like I'm working. I'd say in a given week, I probably only do about 15 minutes of real, actual work. I don't know what's going on with that, like the, the fact that that content is acceptable. A film is completely a cultural creation and culture is completely a human creation. This thing, this me thing that feels and that has a point of view, that has to have a hand in this selection and composing process. Otherwise, it will just become either nonsense or generic. Scene 17, take one. Mark. Have you seen Babylon? Uh, yes. Do you remember the scene where they are shooting on the soundstage? Yes, yes. I want to talk about that scene and trajectory phrasing because I thought yes. that is cut brilliantly. Tom Cross sets up a rhythm. Hello, college. Uh, <laughs> And then they go take after take after take. Action. Each take, he goes faster and faster and faster with going through the same steps again and again. Cut, Mr. Mark, now. Oh, it's... Scene 17, take three. Mark. Action. Oh, hello, Carl. Cut, no good for sound. Well, fucking hell, Lloyd, could you just let us get through one take? Down. It's a masterclass on how to educate the audience how the scene will play and then get to the next level and the point of the scene faster and faster. Hello, Motherfucker! Great example. Each time the character Margot Robbie is playing walks into the room, she's repeating the same trajectory in the same rhythm. Hello, Who's these? Each time the character of the director says Action. she's repeating the same trajectory in the same rhythm. Hello, Colin. No, you're Mark. Ah! 
They train us, they set us up so that we know what the rhythm should feel like and we almost get there and then it's a fail. And the fail is actually the emotional story of that moment. And then the editor keeps interrupting their trajectories at a slightly different point or with a slightly different emphasis. So he's really using this phrasing of each character's motion trajectory to tell us a story of mounting frustration. Hello? Hi, this is Joanne. What can people take away from this concept and how can they apply it? One of the key takeaways to understanding trajectory phrasing is to kind of tune your eye to the intention behind movement. You want to start to be able to see how people's movement is affecting other people or affecting the circumstances. Team 17, take eight. Mark. What you're doing next is you're making the energy in one shot meet the energy in the next shot, either by matching it or by changing it, right? And you can start to read that intention. So be aware of the intention. Like notice what you're, what you're feeling in response to, it's like tune yourself, pick up the real nuance, the refinement, because this is what will lift your editing from being, yeah, fine, to being, wow, I really felt that. The other takeaway that you, you can get is developing your skills at phrasing. You know, bring in your tools of timing and pacing to help you with this, and you can start to phrase things so that they build tension or they release tension. Trajectory phrasing is part of Karen's book, Cutting Rhythms. Here's a little takeaway I can give you. Timing is where and when to put a shot. Pacing is how quickly or slowly to cut. Trajectory phrasing is about how things are done and why they are done. It's the how and why. And the why is why we care. And if you as an editor can master the why, you are elite. One of the most important concepts in editing is this. He looks, he sees, he thinks. Three cuts that tell a thought where viewers derive more meaning from the interaction of the shots than from every single one in isolation. It's often referred to as the Kuleshov effect. But there's a person who disagrees with calling this effect just that. This is Coffee with Editors. All right, hi, welcome to another episode of Coffee with Editors. Today, we have very special guests here. Dr. Karen Perlman, this is how you look like. Uh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> Hopefully you've seen all the This Guy Edits, Science of Editing episodes on the channel. One, two, one, two. Essentially, this cut is saying Deckard and the owl are alike. If not, go watch him. We just met in person basically for the first time yesterday while you were having a panel at USC and talking about your latest project. Can you talk a little bit about what you were doing over there? Okay, so I was at USC for a conference called Visible Evidence, which is a big documentary maker and documentary scholar conference. I went there to deliver a paper about my research, mm -hmm. which is into creative process and especially women in film history. How does that work as an academic? Is it like you pick that as your research project or? Yeah, or the research project in in a way kind of picked me okay because I started out at working in the university about five years ago and I was an editor I had specialized in editing and done my PhD in editing and so I wrote a thesis I wrote a doctoral thesis and then sent it off as a book proposal cutting rhythms I was working on a, a particular film that I really really love called man with a movie camera and I realized that I love the editing in it, but if the editing is always attributed to the director. Mm -hmm. But the director wasn't the only editor. The director's wife was also there, and she was editing it, and so I suddenly went, wow, there's a whole history there of women editors, and they had a huge impact. I think the most wonderful thing about editing is that you're given all this raw material and it's your job to make choices into how to focus the scene. But you're looking for sympathy, is that it, sweetie? Why don't you go fuck yourself, Tommy? Oh. 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 
<laughs> it's the most incredibly creative act anybody can have, I think. I respect for this, he's got a lot of fucking balls. <laughs> so how much movement there is on this? I need that same feeling. You can let this fucking punk get away with that? What's the matter? What's the world coming to? So how do you like that? How's that, all right? So you all know the Kuleshov effect, and if you look, Sven's done a video about it. Basically, what people think it is, is kind of cross-cutting, or, you know, shot reverse shot cutting. What we're doing as an audience, and this is really core to what editing is, yeah. is we are making an inference about what that person is thinking. Yeah. Right? So we don't know what they're thinking, but you kind of, as an audience, you add in. And of course, it's the editor's job to get it right, to get the timing right, to get the look right, to get the eye line right, the object right. <clears throat> so that the audience has the maximum intended inference from the sequence that you're mm -hmm. getting. But here's the thing. Mm -hmm. You ready for this? I know what's coming, so okay. yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> right. uh, Kuleshov did not invent this, and so we should not call it the Kuleshov effect. Karen made a film about crediting this effect to Kuleshov. And you're gonna be able to see it at the end of the video. In early cinema, most editors were women. Why would you name something lots of women and editors were doing after one man who observed them doing it? I'm reclaiming this. Kuleshov was a filmmaker and he was making films in like 1919 and so forth. But there were a whole circle of people around him and he became a teacher. So he was in the very first film school in Russia. And really what he did was actually about five of these so-called experiments. But to him, they weren't actually experiments. They were more like demonstrations. They were teaching materials in a way. What Kuleshov theorized was that if you put a neutral face in there, you would get a different idea from what you cut in the middle. So we have a shot of a person looking, shot of a bowl of soup, you come back to the person and you think they look hungry. It wasn't that he was hypothesizing that this effect would occur. He was demonstrating that this effect would occur. He'd already used it in movies, but even more importantly, lots of people had used it in movies. So. Now you get to ask me, why is this important, Karen? Karen, why yes? is this important? Well, damn it. <laughs> Editing is one of the only places in film that women have had a fair go. Mm. And there were women in the edit suites. And they were doing this quote-unquote Kuleshov effect from the beginning, yeah. right? It's all about how we tell the story. So. The reason I don't want to call it the Kuleshov effect is because that's a way of telling the story that erases the work of a whole lot of editors, many of whom were women. So I'm totally on board with that, and you coined a new name for this effect. What should we call it? I think we should call it the editor's effect. Mm, nice, I like that. Yeah. It feels like we're all owning this effect now. And we and should. It's, it's honoring not only the past, this is what we're constantly doing when we're telling stories, when we're putting shots together. This is something that editors really have for themselves. <laughs> But it's, it's really what the editor does, and what they were demonstrating is the editor has a huge amount of power in doing it too. Because yeah. you can actually drop a different object in there, or a different reaction shot, and change the story. It's literally changing the storytelling. Yeah. And that's the editor's effect. That's one of the biggest misconceptions. I actually read comments on my channel where people are like, why does the editor matter? They're just putting together the stuff that's shot. <laughs> you just need somebody to do that part, but it's basically all there and it's not. It's like you have one editor, it's a completely different film than another editor. Yeah, I think that's really, really true. And I think that one of the reasons that women kind of get erased from this part of film mm. history is because in a way, editors altogether get erased from film history. Yeah. It's like people don't really realize how significant editing is or what editors are really doing when they're making cuts and making choices and telling the story. It was considered to be a woman's job because it was something like sewing, that you took these pieces of fabric, which is what film are, and you put them together. It was when sound came in that the men began to infiltrate the ranks of the editors because sound was somehow electrical. It was technical. It was no longer knitting. I'm pretty sure George Miller said this. If 
a man would have cut Mad Max Fury Road. It wouldn't have worked. It took a woman to cut this action film. <laughs> yeah, do you I've agree heard with that statement? Or the question really is like, do women cut differently because of cultural background or sensitivity or whatever it is? There are certain qualities that get repeated over and over again about what a good editor needs to have, being a good listener, being kind of nurturing, like all of those things are associated with, with editors that people want to work with. Margaret Sixel, Mad Max Fury Road. And those are often also associated with women, but you know, feminism is liberation of men too. You know what I mean? Like, go for it, be patient, be a good listener, be nurturing. Those are great things for a guy to be too. Now, without further ado, here's Karen's film After the Facts. Pay attention to the editing and let me know in the comments if you notice something. Is there something you want to say about it? Yeah, look, I mean, a lot of this, the videos on this channel are about storytelling and I'm really saying about the history, we need to tell a different story. You know, if I put it in one line, the story I'd want to tell is this. Good editing is not invisible and neither are the women who do it. Nice. Let's take a look. <laughs> These images are facts. Film facts. Real images of real people, not staged or imagined. Facts. Facts become thoughts when you cut them together. Shot of a woman looking, shot of what she sees, shot of what she thinks. Shot of a woman looking, shot of what she sees, shot of what she thinks. She looks, she sees, she thinks. Three facts made into a thought. Editing film facts into film thoughts is sometimes called the Kuleshov effect. But I think that is strange. In early cinema, most editors were women. Why would you name something lots of women and editors were doing after one man who observed them doing it? I'm reclaiming this and naming it the editor's effect. Esfir Shub was a filmmaker who told stories with the editor's effect. She is often credited with inventing the remix film. She wrote, the intention was not so much to provide the facts, but to evaluate them from the vantage point of the revolutionary class. Esfir Shub and her colleagues Dizzy Gavertov and Elitsaveta Svilova made films from facts. They had a vision for a huge room full of film facts, an archive, a mine for ideas about the world. But their political leader did not like their version of the facts. He wanted alternate facts. He wanted to see the Soviet Union as a musical. Shub did not want to make a musical. Shub and Vertov and Svilova wanted to make films about real women and real work. Shub wrote, I wanted to make an image of the magnificent rhythms of work. They never got a chance to realize their visions. Stalin wanted to suppress their versions of the facts. The world wanted to suppress their versions of women. I think a lot about what their films would have been like. So I've mined films they did get to make. I've used their films as though they are rooms full of possible ideas about the world. These edits are my thoughts.
Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. Knowing all this is really going to help you become a better creative editor. But I also want to point out if you're really interested in building a career as an editor, there are some critical mistakes you can avoid right from the start that put you on the wrong path. And I just released a video about that with uh, Zach Arnold, who is an ACE editor, where we go through the five uh, most common mistakes that beginner editors make. You can watch it right now by clicking the link right here.